would like to turn it over to Dustin for our last Q&A of the day. Dustin, take over. All right, thank you for that uh, phenomenal panel and especially thank you, Michelle, for taking that time to present to us. Uh, we don't have a ton of questions for Michelle. Everyone just loves you and it's cheering you on. Um, Michelle, I have a question to start you off and I don't see you on the, there you are. Michelle, do you think that sprint training helped you as a thrower? You said sprint training? Yep, when you trained yeah. as a sprinter earlier in your career? Yes, I did. Um, I, I did think that sprint training helped a lot because it helped with that explosive power. Because um, as a shot putter, I am trying to create as much power in a seven foot ring. So learning how to react like you do in the blocks, you have to react as soon as you hear the gun go off. That really helps my reaction time in the ring. So I didn't sprint as far as the sprinters did, but they had a hard time beating me for 10, 20 meters. <laughs> And then Michelle, we're, we're curious, we had a good presentation today from Bahati Van Pelt with the USOPC about athlete career and education. And we're interested in knowing what your plans are. We know you've got these Tokyo games now pushed off a year. After that, what are you going to do? Well, my plans is, I'm still working on my plans, but uh, I have a girls camp that I have called You Throw Girl, Sports Confidence Camp. And it's for young female athletes from junior high to high school, where I pour into them, not just as athletes, but who they are as young women. We have different classes for them, um, just to kind of build their confidence in who they are on and off the track. So that's one of the things that I really am going to dive into uh, after I'm done throwing as well as speaking. We're, we can't wait to learn more about that as you build that out even more in the next few years. So if you talked about uh, the, the lack of quality training for female athletes and how strength um, is a risk factor that we should be looking at, and you were it was the middle of the night in Australia, but Ski and Snowboard, Jillian Bowers from Ski and Snowboard presented today, and she showed that strength is protective for ACL injuries in their database. Um, what do you think we're doing? I mean, you, you called it out a little bit, but could you expand on what do you think we're doing wrong when training female athletes and how we can get better? Yeah, so, you know, it's tough to to hear what I'm going to say, which is when we identify something like this that we can fix, we, we feel like we want to fix it immediately. But the the truth of the matter is that this fix is a long-term thing, and, and that strength development, although we can do it in blocks or over a couple of years when we have an older athlete, really this needs to happen a lot earlier in their career because it is the mix of that strength along with learning to use that strength, which would be motor coordination, that really has to happen. It has to uh, kind of marinate over time. And I do think the strength immediately can help, but it's not the whole story. So I didn't want people to think that that's that's all we need to do. It'd be nice if we could do that. But the reason I highlight that is because the alternative or what we really need is actually more of that 10, 15 year plan of strength and motor coordination development for the athlete. But um, in, in simple, uh, it is definitely protective. But the strength itself has to be manifested with um, things such as your uh, pre-activity and, and we, we've looked at um, that previously and pre-activity prior to the event is really that mediating factor for preventing the event being an ACL tear from happening. Because the ACL is just like a seatbelt, right? But if you're driving around a car and the car is your body and your car is made of glass, no one cares you have your seatbelt on. And our musculature and the ability to pre-activate that musculature before you hit the ground or before you hit an unexpected event is indeed the integrity of the car. The seatbelt, if you're worrying about the seatbelt, that's the last case scenario. So that's why I try to focus on the external factors and not relate back to even if the ligament is affected maybe by estrogen. And I do think that that's a tenuous link. It's whether there's factors that contribute to the event prior because the ACL tears in 15 to 50 milliseconds and so that is not active enough time for the ligament to even care. It actually has to be pre-activity of the musculature. And so strength has to be there, but then the ability to call on that strength needs to be there. So there are multiple layers to it. 
Thank you. Dr. Ackerman and Dr. Oleka, we'll let you take this one one at a time. We have a million questions around birth control. How does birth control interact with amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea? How does it affect your screening for red S? What should uh, athletes think about when choosing a birth control? Does it affect performance? I'm confident you guys could talk to us about this for many hours. Can you give us each your most important points on the topic? Uh, Dr. Ackerman, we'll go with you first. I love how you're gonna keep us in check. Good point. Um, so there's so many things to talk about birth control. First of all, my focus with REDS, I think it's really important to realize you can't accurately screen about menses if somebody's on the pill. Now, of course, a lot of our athletes are on a birth control pill. So if we're worried about low energy availability, we should certainly be asking them, did they get normal periods before they were on the pill? Why were they placed on the pill? Was it because they weren't getting a period or was it because they needed it for birth control reasons? What was their weight when they were put on the pill? And then what pill are they on? So we never want to prescribe someone a birth control pill to give them a menstrual cycle back, but we do have to work with athletes who need birth control pills for um, birth control and contraceptive reasons. Thank you guys so much. So I completely agree with uh, everything that Dr. Ackerman has said. It really comes down to the why. So why, you know, is contraception being initiated? Why is that taken into consideration? Is there true menstrual dysfunction? Is there um, a contraceptive need? Just keeping in mind, if there is, you know, dysmenorrhea or PMS, the birth control of the contraception um, can help to negate some of the negative side effects or the troubling side effects that can happen as a result of that dysfunction. Um, so the idea is to try to decrease that so that the athlete can, you know, perform um, to the best of their ability. True, if there is a concern for irregular menstruation or a female athlete triad or res, that will be masked with the birth control. So when it comes to prescribing, you do want to make sure that you're individualizing, you know, that um, treatment to the athlete and to the overall um, goal. And there's a bunch of different types of birth control. I think oftentimes we tend to think of just the pill, um, but there are patches and rings and, you know, larks or implants, um, as well as depo. And so there's a, a myriad of different um, contraceptive options that can um, affect the cycle in different ways. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to the why. Um, and if you're having menstrual dysfunction that's affecting your performance, um, then being on a birth control could potentially um, help your performance because you're not dealing with that dysfunction anymore. Thank you, and unfortunately, we only have time for one more question, and Michelle, after your last response, uh, people want to know how they can get involved with your camps. Uh, yes, you can go to um, shotdiva.com, which is S-H-O-T-D-I-V-A, <laughs> and uh, my camp information is there, and you can find all the information on there. Shotdiva.com and I think a lot of people are interested in volunteering and helping out. Thank you all for an excellent panel. Uh, we're gonna kick it over to Charlie, who's going to close out the day for us. Dr. Nymphius, Dr. Olika, and Dr. Ackerman, thank you so much. And hopefully I can share your content with my marathoner wife and my two daughters. <laughs> hopefully that's okay. And Michelle, thank you for inspiring us and being such a great ambassador for our mission and our movement. So this is wrapping it up. We're gonna be done here. What a transformative day. Uh, my last two shout outs, our last two shout outs, Frank Nagayan from Stanford. Thank you for joining us today. Please say hi to John Denny for us. And Scott Thurston from the Tampa Rays baseball team. Thank you for joining us and thank you for sending Joe Madden to the Chicago Cubs. First of all, Thank you to all of our presenters for your gift of time and your gift of knowledge. Thank you to the sponsors and the underwriters today that made today possible. Kimduct, Proofpoint, Proofpoint Biologics, Bowed Performance, the Stedman Philippone Research Institute and Clinic, and the United States Olympic and Paralympic Foundation. Thank you all for your underwriting of today's uh, virtual presentation and symposium. And then finally, 4,800 participants joined us today. They gifted us with their time and hopefully left with some incredible knowledge based on the incredible content and the unbelievable presenters. Um, we will see you in Vail.
next year at the fifth annual Injury Prevention Symposium, April 28th through May 1st. Registration materials will be coming out in the near future. Um, and we're looking forward to doing this again in person and celebrating the fifth anniversary. And uh, in closing, we again wanted to thank the medical providers, um, first responders, and all essential employees that are doing so much and doing so much heroic efforts in support of everybody impacted by COVID-19. Again, thank you for participating today and everybody be safe.